Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our debate on science, society, and our planet. My name is Matt Hutchings. I'm Professor of Molecular Microbiology at UEA, and I'll let the panel introduce themselves. <laughs> We're just breaking the technology already. Is it? Okay. Hello. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm Alicia, and I'm doing a PhD at the John Inner Centre at the Research Park, and I work in um, molecular microbiology. So I'm interested in a type of bacteria called Streptomyces. Um, these bacteria produce a lot of antibiotics naturally, so we're really interested in trying to find more of these molecules and understand how they're made. Um, hello everyone, um, I'm Jemima Brinton. Um, I'm from Suffolk, so not too far, just across the border. Um, I also work at the John Innes Centre, just up by the hospital. Um, so I did my PhD there, uh, finished in 2017, I'm still working there, and my research interests are in wheat. So in particular, understanding how we can work out what genes and mechanisms control um, kind of the yield of wheat. So in particular, I'm interested in understanding the genes that control the size of the grain. Um, so if we can increase the size of the grain, then the idea is that we can breed uh, wheat varieties with higher yield that can ho hopefully contribute towards food security. Um, so with uh, this, we have a lot of interactions also with breeders and farmers. So we can see that the research that we're doing is actually relevant to kind of uh, problems that we need to address in society. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Laurie and I'm a PhD student at the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research at the UEA. So my research focuses disruptive low carbon innovations and these are innovations which are products or services which people such as ourselves can buy and use which offer something new and different to consumers and they also offer a low carbon alternative to the way that things are currently done. Um, so examples include how we get around, how we eat, how we live at home. Um, so despite their promise, disruptive low-carbon innovations currently exist in niches and haven't penetrated the mass market. And because of this, their impact in terms of emission reductions has been limited. But to help mitigate climate change, they must diffuse rapidly and be adopted extensively throughout the population. So in particular, in my research, I'm looking at two disruptive low-carbon innovations. And both of these use a sharing economy business model. So the first uh, innovation that I'm looking at is called peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. And this is when an individual can choose to rent out their own car to somebody else. And the second innovation I'm looking at is called peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing. Um, and so this is the idea that you travel in a car with someone else. Um, and so while carpooling has been around for a long time, the rise of the internet has mean that you can now be connected with a vast pool of strangers through which to share your journeys. And both of these innovations um, challenge the need to own a car and promote a system of access over ownership. Um, and that's what I'm looking at, the, the potential impact that could have on emissions. Okay, thank you. So as you can see, our panel are experts on food security, antimicrobial resistance, and low carbon innovations to address climate change. Um, so we welcome questions from the audience. Uh, does anybody want to start us off with a question for the panel? If not, I have some pre-prepared questions <laughs> sent in in advance. Um, so start with Alicia. Could you explain to us what antimicrobial resistance is, please? So antimicrobial resistance basically refers to the ability of microbes to evolve resistance to antibiotics or antimicrobial compounds. So bacteria are very clever and they can evolve ways to basically become resistant to certain antibiotics. And there are different kind of mechanisms that they do this. So for example, one way is they can produce enzymes which will recognize a certain chemical structure and basically chop it in half. So your antibiotics obviously now ineffective. Um, bacteria can also produce um, sort of literally little pumps in their membranes and they'll just um, chuck out the antibiotics from their cell. So um, obviously, obviously it's a big problem because if people become infected with an infection which is resistant to antibiotics, that obviously limits, limits your treatment choices. So um, it's a big problem at the moment and on the increase. Great, thank you. So, so I also work on antibiotics, so my lab is uh, interested in finding new antibiotics. And I'm always curious uh, to ask audiences if there's anybody here who's never taken antibiotics. Anyone put their hand up, never taken antibiotics? Everybody in this room has taken them. Anybody ever had a life-threatening infection? 
Because isn't it true that you should only take antibiotics for life-threatening infections? Yeah, exactly. So one of the problems we have is a lot of people take them unnecessarily, and that obviously um, increases resistance because bacteria are exposed to them when they don't really need to be. So, for example, if you have a cough or a cold, that's probably caused by a virus, and antibiotics are not effective against viruses. So um, lots of people will kind of demand antibiotics when they don't really need them, and that obviously contributes to the problem because bacteria are exposed, they then become resistant, and it's kind of an ongoing cycle. Okay. So this is one of the global challenges that's really facing humanity. I mean, it's a crisis. We have, we've only had antibiotics for 100 years, uh, and already we've reached the stage where they don't work anymore. Does anybody have any questions about antimicrobial resistance or antibiotics? Yes. Um, that's absolutely true. Yeah, that's true. Um, so there's a concept called antimicrobial stewardship. Um, so that's basically um, trying to promote uh, um, responsible prescribing and making sure people get the drugs they need, but only when they need them, basically. So um, um, obviously doctors should only prescribe antibiotics if you definitely need them. Um, in some countries, it's worse than others. Like Some countries can actually buy them off a shelf, which is obviously a really big problem. But... Um, there are definitely kind of global efforts now to really make sure that there are initiatives in place to kind of make sure antibiotics are prescribed responsibly. So I think that's something that's definitely improving. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so obviously antibiotics are quite widely used in agriculture as well, and that kind of obviously adds to the problem. Um, any antibiotics that are used in agriculture, they're going to be spread into our environments, water systems, and again, resistance spreads really easily. So um, there are um, some rules um, about um, the amount of antibiotic antibiotics you can use. So again, it varies in different countries. Um, there, there is kind of Europe-wide legislation about it to try and reduce it and make sure that... Um, especially really important antibiotics are not used in animals. Um, again, some countries are worse than others, but um, again, I think that's another problem that's um, come to attention. People are trying to work to reduce that. Yeah, they do estimate that probably around 50% of all antibiotics ever used have been put into agriculture, mostly as animal feed additives to make cattle you know, get bigger faster so farmers can make more money, which is banned now in most countries. Uh, we're not going to talk about the EU tonight. <laughs> it's kind of off limits, but yes. Yeah. So it's it under e yeah under EU rules it is banned now, um, but farmers can get round it because you can't prove they're adding antibiotics as a feed supplement rather than to treat disease or prevent disease. So not all farmers obey the rules. I think. Yes. Do you want to answer that? Yep. Um, so obviously there, um, there is kind of a natural cause to, to resistance. Um, nature will evolve ways, but I think human use is definitely contributing to it. Um, so in terms of looking for alternatives, was that your question? Yeah. Um, so obviously we're interested in finding new antibiotics. That's what um, a lot of our research is based on. Um, there are also alternatives to antibiotics, which um, I don't know as much about, but things like bacteriophage therapy, um, but yes, obviously a lot of antibiotic discovery is um, research in progress. Yeah, so resistance is inevitable, but we can slow it down. We know now uh, how to be sensible with antibiotic use. So don't give them out to anybody that doesn't have a life-threatening infection. Use them in rotation, so don't use the same antibiotic for everybody. Um, and multi-drug therapy, using more than one antibiotic at a time, can slow the evolution of resistance. So we hope that when we get the next generation of antibiotics, we'll use them more sensibly and they'll last a lot longer. Uh, should we move on to food security? So I have an interesting question <laughs> for you. So are genome engineered crops safe to eat? Um, that is a very big question. It is a big um, question. And 
So it's not, I didn't ask the question. This no, fair, fair enough. Fair in. enough. There's nothing you can do it about it. No. So I think that before you start tackling the kind of question of our genome engineered crops safe to eat, I think you have to go back a few steps and kind of ask the question: What is genome engineering? How should we be assessing it? Um, and what are its implications, its benefits, and its drawbacks? So one thing uh, that I guess. I would consider genome engineering is, is just a tool for breeding. So the way that we breed our crops kind of traditionally is um, essentially taking advantage of what we already have in the natural population. So say I'm interested in breeding a new variety of wheat, I might find a wheat that has really big grains. And I'm like, okay, cool. I would really like to make all of my wheat have big grains like that. Uh, the conventional way that breeders would do this is to take that particular variety of wheat that they think outperforms all the others, cross it with other varieties of wheat and see if you can progressively select for things based on their phenotype or the way that they look. So you're selecting just for the things that look like the things you want. Um, so that's kind of how very traditionally you would get high yielding crops for selecting for the things that have higher yields and then using those to grow the next year. You then kind of, as technology progresses, you have ways of enhancing how you're doing this breeding. So just um, selecting things by eye can take a very long time. So conventional breeding methods, it'll take maybe 15 or 20 years to get from kind of that conception of a new variety to the actual field. Um, the introduction of genetic markers, so that's being able to say, okay, how is this, um, how is this trait that I'm interested in related to the genome? And then being able to tag that particular beneficial gene and say, okay, I've got my marker and I now know that when I make, when I make all these different crosses, you can say before you've even grown the plant, which one is going to have that trait that you're interested in? And this can really speed things up. The next thing that you can do is to say, okay, we've got this variation that exists already, but actually we know that because of the nature of agriculture, we actually have quite limited natural variation in the crops that we have. Um, and then we kind of get onto the subject of trying to uh, introduce new variation. So um, you can do this through a range of techniques. So something that is really widely used is mutagenesis. Um, so that's just treating uh, plants with a particular chemical or various treatment to generate um, kind of random changes in the genome. And then from that, you see which of these random changes are able to produce something beneficial in the crop. And then you can go about that as you did with your kind of conventional breeding um, techniques. And that's how a lot of our crops have been bred. And then we get to genome engineering. And that's saying, OK, instead of making these random changes, can I make a change that's more specific and something that I understand? So with kind of traditional genetically modified organisms, that can be taking a gene from either another species or from the same species and saying, I know that this gene controls X trait and whatever. Can I introduce it into my crop um, through uh, technologies such as genome um, engineering without having to go through the decades of crossing um, that will um, be the normal method for conventional breeding. So you have yeah, gene, uh, genetic modification where you introduce uh, new genes or remove bits of sequence. Um, but then we also have this new technology now called genome editing. And so genome editing is not introducing anything new into the genome. It's literally going through the DNA sequence and changing maybe one or two letters. Uh, sometimes it can also be just deleting a letter. And so that's how you then can generate this new variation. So there are all these different tools. They all come with their uh, benefits um, and their disadvantages. And so I guess the question of is genome edited food safe to eat for, to finally get around to it, I think it really depends on what you're editing. So I think that a much better way of assessing whether these foods are safe to eat is actually what is the final product that you're making. So we know like throughout life, there are loads of technologies that can be used for good or for bad. And you don't tend to ban a technology. So, you know, plastic, making plastic, perhaps not a good one to use because of whatever, but you can use plastic to make a bowl or you can use it to make a gun, right? So like there are all these different things that you can do. So I think really that you can't give a definite answer to whether they're safe to eat or not, because it really depends on what trait you're putting into that crop. Yeah. Well, pretty much all the crops we eat now are genome engineered through traditional breeding or- Exactly, not so natural. you're you're modifying the genome, yeah. but it's just this specific um, new method of modifying the genome that has been labeled as the genetically modified. Yeah, anybody have any questions about GM foods? or food security, how we're going to feed a glo growing global population. Yes. Uh, it, seems like, um, sorry. Oh, you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, it seems this might be a bit naive. I forgot what my question is now. Um, <laughs> it was something to do with like the race uh, with like climate change accelerating and this being um, 
a potential way of fixing um, if you can get it on a mass scale of, of um, hunger around the world and also the shrinking, I guess, uh, um, chance that we have to grow crops, what with, you know, climate change from a very naive point of view. So, um, but I think uh, my question was around, is there um, more of a demand for it now? In terms of genome? Yeah, and uh, and if not, um, if you're kind of fence, sitting on a fence between the debate, whether it's good or bad, what might be the alternatives? Mm. So I think that there are a lot of things that genome editing and genome engineering allow us to do, um, both, like you say, because of the urgency that we have. So we need to... I think double the number of crops that we, or like the amount of crops that we produce by 2050 to keep up with demand. So the rate of our yield increases are nowhere near the rate of our yield demand as it's going. And I think it equates to something like, in that time we need to produce as many crops as we've produced since the beginning of agriculture. So it's, it's a lot, right? And if you're just, if you're using conventional breeding methods, they're fine, but they take a really long time. So one of the big, um, advantages of GM is that it has a lot more speed because you can very specifically edit things without having to go through all of those long generation times. I think it also allows us to innovate in a way that perhaps we wouldn't be able to otherwise. So it can be very difficult to find the traits that you're looking for in like crops as they exist already because by its very nature we've kind of bred them out by breeding for things that are all exactly the same. Um, one of the really cool uses I think of GM uh, editing is by you can go back to wild relatives of crops and see what traits they have that are beneficial to them. But obviously, wild crops, if you look at them, they look nothing like the crops you'd want to eat. But perhaps they are very drought tolerant, for example. Now, if you're try trying to introduce that drought tolerance just by crossing a plant, you then have to redo all of your kind of domestication process and breeding again. But if you were able to introduce that specific genetic change straight into our modern crop varieties, then suddenly you've got this drought resistant crop which is really um, great. And then the other thing is that there are also, so one of the main problems is that we really do need to be producing higher yields on the land that we already have, because we just cannot afford to expand agriculture more at all. But then also GM crops allows, allow us to do kind of new and interesting things. So for example, one uh, example that I really like, that's actually a real life example, so it's not a hypothetical one, is that um, it's not only that we need to produce more crops, but we need to make sure they give us the correct nutritional value because that's a huge problem. So a vast proportion of the world are undernourished. Um, so, for example, one thing that it's really important that we get into our diet is um, oils like omega-3. Plants don't really produce these. They produce a different type of the oils, but fish are the predominant kind of source of this uh, omega-3. Um, however, the way that the fish get these is by eating other fish that eat marine or like microbes and stuff that will generate these products. Um, but when you farm fish really intensively, they don't have time in their life cycle to eat these fish and then to accumulate these oils. So the way that the industry gets around it at the moment is by getting all those other fish from the oceans, grinding them up, feeding them to the farmed fish at the end of their life so that then they accumulate the oils. But there's a group at Rothamsted Research who've been able to work out how these microbes are generating this oil, transform that pathway into a crop called camelina. So it's an oil seed. So they can then grow these oil seeds, extract the oil from those plants, and then these fish can be fed on those oils throughout their life. So it's a much more sustainable way of doing it. So I think that there are those kind of two things that gives us the speed and it also allows for innovation to solve these other problems. Uh, yes. Um, do you think GM crops will be enough if we don't tackle the food waste and greed in like first world countries? I think that's a really good point. And I think that, yeah, we have to like, I guess I work on genetics. So that's the thing that probably when people ask me first, that's my first answer. But definitely you're completely right that it's not the only solution. We need to be able to increase the yields, but also we need to have um, less waste at all kind of all points of the production and consumption chain. And then also kind of make sure that the way that we're producing our food is the most efficient and sustainable way to do so. And you're absolutely right that in different parts of the world, the, uh, the factors that will make the most difference will be very, very different. So for example, in the first world, food wastage at the point of the retailer and the consumer is huge. But actually in other parts of the world, the kind of wastage and loss is actually because there isn't the infrastructure to properly store the food when it's harvested. So if all of the storage, if there is any, gets filled up, then the rest of the crop is just left in the field to rot because there's nothing else to do with it. So by introducing kind of infrastructure changes that can tackle those things, they will be really important. 
Is there a sort of upper limit on the number of genes you can introduce into an organism before it sort of loses its biological function? That is a very interesting question. Wheat has quite a lot of genes. Yeah, so wheat, so I guess that is the place to start, right? So one gene as a proportion of the rest of the genes, how, how much is that? So wheat is kind of a special case in a way. So the wheat genome is enormous. Wheat has three genomes. Uh, the genome size is bigger than five times the human genome. Um, it has, I think, 101,000 genes in it. So introducing one more, probably not going to change it too much. Um, plants are interesting because they have this, I mean, it's a whole other story. They have a huge range in genome sizes and they do all sorts of crazy things. Um, I think really it's kind of trial, trial and error, right? And seeing what things work together. Um, I think how many genes you're able to introduce is another question entirely. Um, I think also something that's really important to consider is how all these different genes interact, both with each other and with the existing genome. Um, and one of the like kind of important strategies is to recognize that not just one gene is going to do everything. Um, and that's actually, I kind of wanted to say it while we were on the subject of antimicrobial uh, antibiotic resistance, is that you kind of have a kind of similar thing in plants with disease resistance and things like that. So say you find a gene that makes a crop resistant to a disease fine, you introduce it, but then there's a lot of pr pressure on that crop to then evolve, or not on the crop, on the disease to evolve resistance to this resistance gene. So then you have to start looking at strategies where you start pyramiding or combining different genes together. So then, yeah, you have a more kind of integrated approach to improving. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, I know. So it's actually really quite common in the plant world. So wheat has three genomes, and we always, as wheat re researchers, say, oh gosh, this makes everything too complex, and aren't we clever? Not the case. But I mean, some, some plants have, like melon has a ridiculous number of genomes. Um, but it's an interesting thing because it's one of the theories as to why plants have been able to evolve such big diversity and colonize so many different places is the fact that they duplicate, they are able to duplicate their genomes and then that gives them the kind of flexibility to let genes do other things that they might not have been able to do. So if you imagine if you have one gene that does a specific role, it can only really ever do a specific role because it's the only thing doing it in the genome. But when you start to duplicate or triplicate, triplicate your genomes, then the genes have a little bit more flexibility. So, so maybe they can start evolving different functions. And no, so they all exist together in the same nucleus. Um, wheat is an interesting one because the three genomes eff effectively act independently, so they don't tend to interact with each other. Uh, there are other plants um, where the three genomes will interact a bit more and start doing interesting things. But yeah, it's very interesting from a scientific perspective. But okay, okay, I've got a question. Oh, yes. Doesn't that make genome engineering really difficult? Yeah, There's so that's actually what I was just about that's to say. So it, here, it, it poses a problem, but also an advantage in a way. So it poses a problem in the sense that if, so quite a lot of, um, I guess, genome editing is done by changing uh, the gene so that it doesn't work anymore. Um, so for example, uh, my particular interest is in the growth of the grain. So you can imagine that actually for a plant, it's a pretty good strategy to regulate the growth of your grain by limiting its growth because you don't want it to go crazy and just use all the uh, nutrients that it has. Um, so actually, if you find these genes that are kind of putting the brakes on growth and stop them from working, then you can cause the plant to grow a bit more. The issue comes when you have three copies of those genes. And if you just knock one out, then you're only taking off one break and the plant is still being like, oh, slow down. So sometimes you have to introduce more edits or different copies of the gene to have the full effect. However, on the other hand, you don't necessarily want to completely crazily change um, your plant, right? So for example, I quite often get the question when I give talks of you know, how big is too big? What if you make a grain that just causes the plant to fall over? But by having those three genomes, it allows you to fine tune the response a little bit more. So I think it's pros and cons. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, wait for the mic, please. Going back to your earlier comments about food security, I, I know this is a simplistic question and I'm not expecting a definite answer, um, but I'm interested to know if, through the work that you and many other scientists are doing, do you foresee a time when we've solved world food shortages? Or are inequalities in the world such that we're never going to solve it? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a really difficult question to give a definitive answer to. But um, I think it's, 
yeah, we're not going to be able to solve all the problems with scientific solutions unless the political and cultural <coughs> change also comes. And there really is a huge infrastructure change that is required to address these things. And I mean, it has to happen on kind of a global scale. Individual changes are really good, but ultimately the structure needs to change. And I think that part of the issue is that, okay, we are very privileged in the like places that we live and we're able to make those choices about the food that we eat or whether we say, no, we don't want to eat as much meat. That's, that's, that's a good thing to do. And it is unquestionable that the, f the world consumes too much meat. It's like hundreds of percent over what it should be. But in other parts of the world, people rely on livestock production for their livelihoods. And actually in other places, yes, here we're able to get the full complement of um, nutrients that we need from other sources, but in other places that isn't the case. Um, so, I mean, this isn't really answering your question particularly, but I think that there is a lot that needs to happen together to address things like that. Um, and I think us as individuals can really try to show that we are interested in that change so that it happens, but ultimately it have, needs to be a really coordinated effort from the powers that be to change it on a kind of infrastructure level as well. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give Jemima a rest now because I think we've uh, <laughs> probably exhausted you. Talk, we'll talk about climate change in our cities. All right. That's okay, Laurie? Yeah. Um, so just to kick off, a question that was put in, submitted in advance, what's the best travel habit I can adopt to reduce my carbon footprint? Um, well, what the easy answer... What can people do? <laughs> yeah, literally, walk or cycle. So to use modes of transport which have no um, carbon footprint attached to them. Yeah. Um, but I think the real way that us as individuals can make a, an impactful change is to reduce our reliance on cars. So, are, um, car, are cars the biggest problem, more than aeroplanes? I mean, cars are the biggest problem in people's daily lives. Mm. So it's, it's a practice. Um, it's like a social norm and a practice that you use your car to get around. And there's something shocking, like a car sits idle for 95% of the time um, without being used. And if you think about, so I'm looking at car sharing um, as part of my research. Um, and there was a study done and it said that you could replace 20 private cars with one shared car. And if you think about the impact that that could have, like even in our cities, like the amount of space we would free up if we could divide the number of parking spaces we need by 20 or the number of cars stuck in traffic by 20. Um, so as well as being good in terms of reducing emissions, I think it would also have a really positive change in the way that we live our lives as well. It's a bit of a, a whimsical answer, but, but yeah. <laughs> but, but most of us love our cars, so that's the problem, right? That's true, I yeah. Mean, does, does anybody have any questions about... Why do you love your car? I don't know. Is it that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question, yeah. and, I, and I don't actually use it that much because my children always tell me off every time I drive somewhere because <laughs> they're much more aware than I am. Um, I don't know, I think we're just psychologically tied to cars, aren't we, in mm -hmm. some way? It's a weird thing. Well, some of us are. I guess maybe you're not. I mean, does anybody, anybody have any questions? Uh, sorry, you first and then... Um, do you think, like, congestion charges are a good idea and should they be introduced in more cities? Um, personally, I do think it's a good idea, but I also think it's not really tackling the issue. The issue is that we have too many cars on the road. And so a lot of people grumble about the congestion charge but pay it anyway and so still use their car to go where they should have gone anyway. I think what we need is more of a systemic change. So we need to change our relationships with cars as well. Um, and so maybe the, the way in which to do that is to promote better, more integrated public transport um, rather than, um, yeah, congestion charging. So it's kind of like, do you take the stick approach or the carrot approach? And so do you penalise people for driving their cars or do you make it more inset um uh, incentivizing in more tempting to use car alternatives to travel around. Okay, do we have a question? Yeah, over there. Um, as you, you probably know, living in Norfolk, do you think there is a need for people to live more within a city um, or um, closer to where all public? access things are rather than living out in the countryside where transport public transport is very limited so 
people rely on cars to get around. People rely on, you know, to, for other people to come and see them via cars. Um, do you think that that is something that might have an impact? Um, definitely. So there was a study that came out quite recently comparing the carbon footprint of someone who lives in a city centre with someone of comparable, you know, income and demographic who lives in the countryside. And it was, I can't remember exactly how much higher, but it was like, like a shockingly percentage higher for the person who lives in the countryside. And I think, you know, when you're in a city, maybe Norwich isn't the best example, but if you take another like quite dense city, everything should be within access. And so the, the need to have a car to get around within your city um, is gone, basically. But I completely agree. Um, especially in Norfolk, there's a, a lot of rural villages without bus connections, or if there is a bus connection, it's like once every four hours or something. Um, and so it's not feasible to tell those people that they don't have access to mobility um, without a car. So, yeah, I agree with that. And not everybody can live in the city. Yeah, that's also true. it's expensive and yeah. well, a lot of people don't want to live in the city, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, can you wait for the mic, please? Um, I've got a question around um, swapping them out for, like, electric cars. So, like, if our, we have such a love for cars or, like, a, a reliance on them, um, is there a way of approaching that by introducing electric cars or are they, like, just a kind of a red herring and actually we don't know enough about them? Um, that is an interesting question. I mean, there's a lot of research going on at the moment about whether the mining process is to mine um, the things you need to make the batteries, whether that is sustainable, you know, summed up against the potential savings you make in CO2 emissions. Personally, I think it's this, the whole system of ownership that needs to change and this idea that we have to own a car. Um, so in Norwich, we have the car club. I'm not sure if anyone's part of the of the Cobalt's car club in here, but personally I am, and I think it's amazing. And um, you know, you get all the benefits of having a car, but without any of the hassle. And so it's this uh, system of access over ownership. And I think that's the real way in which we can see change. And if maybe you can access a fleet of electric cars, then even better. Um, but I think if every person who has a car went out and replaced it with an electric car, you know, we'd still have gridlock streets, we'd still have an enormous amount of the city taken up with parking spaces. Yeah, I think I think changing our mindset towards owning a car is going to be more beneficial in the long term. I mean, overall, are electric cars any better for the environment than, than petrol-driven cars? Because... I mean, I like to say yes, those, but I'm those not... batteries <laughs> are, are, are pretty... Uh, yeah, I mean, there is the argument as well about what... Intensive mining requires... Yeah. And obviously, when you charge an electric car, you charge it from the grid, and it depends how the grid itself is supplied as well. Um, in terms of CO2 emissions, there is a benefit to charging an electric car, even if it's from non-renewable resources, um, versus the emissions that you get from petrol or diesel. Um, so, you know, if you take it just looking at CO2 emissions, then yeah, there is a benefit. But if you take it from a whole systemic approach, I don't know. I mean, I like to think so, but yeah. I'm not 100% sure. Anyone else got any questions? Yes. How do you get people to, to take on that new innovation? So something that's a good idea, that's niche. Mm -hmm. that it's, it's, a, it's about changing attitudes and um, there's quite a lot of stuff that's become um, more mainstream recently, but how does that happen? Yeah, really good question. Um, so for my research, I'm using a framework called Diffusion of Innovations Framework. Um, and according to this, there are three main channels through which an innovation will diffuse through the population. And one of those is social networks. And so the people who you, who you surround yourself with do have an impact on, the, on your propensity to adopt an innovation as well. Um, another factor that's really important is the attributes of the innovation. Um, and so one of those things is, is called the relative advantage. And it's, so the added, it's the added benefit or the added value that you get from using this new innovation versus the old innovation. And it's quite interesting because a lot of the um, innovations that we're looking at in my research group score quite poorly on some of these relative advantage attributes versus their like mainstream counterpart. Um, 
but the added value is that they provide a low carbon alternative and maybe a different, uh, a different model of ownership as well. Um, so yeah, there's social networks, um, the attributes of an innovation, and I really can't remember the third one, and <laughs> it's gonna come to me in a second. Oh, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> it's obviously not as important as the other two then. <laughs> but yeah, so it's this whole, like how an innovation will diffuse and be adopted throughout a population is quite, it's a big area of study as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, uh, yeah. In terms of what I'm looking at, so people adopting these shared mobility innovations, and um, there's so many economic benefits, social benefits and environmental benefits that it's almost kind of like a, there's something to please everybody approach. So, you know, you can save a lot of money, it's good for the planet, you can meet people, you can help other people. And so no matter what, kind of what your drivers are, you will find something within the list of potential benefits which can suit you. Um, and I think that's quite interesting as well. Like, yeah, there's something for everyone. Yeah. I mean, this is a question that was submitted as well. So why is societal change really hard? Which I guess applies to, you know, not using your car, eating mm -hmm. less meat, not asking for antibiotics when you go to the doctor. Do you think... There's a generational change. So my children who are seven and 10 talk a lot about climate change mm. and you know, tell me not to use the car and they don't eat meat and all of these things. Do you think the younger generation is gonna save us? Um, hopefully. <laughs> I don't no, think, I don't think the older optimistic. generation's gonna save us. Well, is, is, it, is it gonna be science and technology or is it gonna be societal change? I guess is, is the big I, question. I think it's... We need both. I think right at the moment we're in an interesting time. So obviously Extinction Rebellion <laughs> now is, is in the newspapers pretty much every day, whereas two years ago, it didn't exist. Oh. Um, and I think that's also done a really good job of putting climate change and our choices, our individual choices in people's consciousness. Um, you know, I think if we rely on national policies and like major energy transformations, that's gonna take decades. And we've got so many institutional lock-ins as well within that. Um, but behavior change shifts are actions that we can take now and which are gonna have, you know, quite an immediate impact as well. Any other questions? Yes, at the back. Uh, do things like uh, subsidies of uh, public transport, can they cut down the problems of things like pollution? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, in by subsidising public transport, if you make it more accessible and more appealing to people, and then they then choose to use public transport over using their car, then definitely, yeah. But again, it is that whole idea of you need to change your mindset towards something and your approach. And if the way to change a mindset is to make it more, I'm gonna use that word that I made up again, incentivizing <laughs> to use public transport, then, then yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Have you got any comment to make about the uh, imperative and achievability of net zero by 2025, 2030 or 2050? Um, good question. Um, I think a lot of the pathways which we have, which have been put forward to achieve net zero by 2050 rely on BECs, and so that's bio, bio energy, carbon capture and storage. And it's this idea that we can take carbon dioxide from the air and pump it underground, basically. Um, and obviously this technology is unproven at scale and we don't know if there are gonna be long-term consequences. Um, and so I think that a lot of the pathways are relying on technologies which we don't know the results of. Um, I think or as, a, yeah, as an individual, I'm quite an optimistic person. Um, and I do think that, you know, collectively, individual actions can make a big difference as well. Okay, so just to bring in agriculture as well. So do you think, I mean, it's not just about reducing fossil fuels, presumably. We can do other things like reducing meat consumption. Is that, is that a realistic yeah, so way I, of reducing climate change? Yeah, I think... Change? It's kind of climate change, but also just 
general sustainability as a whole. So there was this really interesting report that came out called the Eat Lancet report. So that was kind of looking at what we can do to essentially uh, remain a healthy society within like our planetary boundary. So that's both in terms of getting um, a diet that's kind of optimal for human health, but also allows us to continue with the earth as we want it to be. So maintaining biodiversity and not you know going overboard with climate change and things like that. And one of the interesting things that came out of that was that actually, yes, um, dietary shift is one of the things that can have the biggest impact on what we're doing. But then also... Um, that's kind of not just necessarily dietary shift in terms of your choice, but also in terms of how the agricultural system is working. So there's fossil fuels, but then there's also kind of water consumption. Um, and then also release of things like methane and nitrous oxide. And then it also comes down to um, how well you're using fertilizers. So excessive fertilizer use is very bad because it runs off into the environment. Um, whereas fertilizer under use is actually also very bad because then it means that land that's being used for agriculture is not being used as efficiently um, as it can be. Um, so I think that there are lots of things in terms of the way that we're using the things that we already do in a more optimal way mm -hmm. to, I can't remember what exactly the point I was trying to make was, um, but in terms of capturing the carbon, but then also using the things that we already do in the most sustainable way possible. I'm not sure if that really yeah, because I, I mean, I read something like there's going to be nine billion people on the planet by 2025 or something, mm. and uh, there's probably enough land to grow food for everybody if they're all vegetarian. But if everybody wants to eat meat, we're in big trouble. Does that sound? Yeah. So in this same report, it was kind of saying that there is like we can come back from where we are, and we will be able to feed the people that we need to feed if all these things happen at once. So I guess this kind of comes back to your question, like, is it possible to achieve what we want to achieve? Um, the thing that kind of came out of that is that if we even increase the amount that we're putting, amount of meat and stuff that we produce, then it's kind of game over. Like, we can't we can't mm. increase it more. Mm. Um, the population will just get bigger again anyway, right? It'll be 12 billion by 2050. Exactly. I mean, that's Maybe a whole other food. that's a whole other thing in itself. I mean, the rate of population increase is actually slowing as like kind of education um, around uh, reproduction and things uh, improves. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to say was, oh yeah, so yes, so firstly, yeah, we can't uh, increase the amount of meat that we produce, and we can't we have we can't increase the land that we use for agriculture because by doing that, we'll be destroying lots of biodiversity and also the land that we haven't already used for agriculture isn't very good for agriculture anyway because it's basically deserts and stuff um but also by shifting our diet towards less meat is not only good for kind of the planet but also for us as individuals so like if we look at the optimal diet that we should be eating um in most of the first world countries it is massively skewed by meat so mm. it's not just improving the health of the planet but the health of people as well so okay Interesting, thank you. Any questions on, yes, can you wait for the mic? So do you think like in terms of all of these problems that reducing the population is more important than anything else because like increasing like family planning education in like thir third world countries, obviously they don't really have a large amount of it. So do you think reducing the population is gonna be like the key to all of the problems basically? Um, no, I don't, I don't think that it is. I mean, also it depends whether you mean reduce the population or reduce the rate at which the population is increasing because I guess they're two different things. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say that we need to like get rid of people because that would be really bad. Um, but, you know, there are things that we can do that, you know, a lot of the agricultural land that is used for crops at the moment isn't being used to its full potential. So there's quite a lot of um, things so known as the yield gap, essentially the amount of yield that you could be getting from land compared to um, the amount of yield you're actually getting. So some in some places that can increase by 75% just by changing practices. And so it doesn't even necessarily need new varieties or anything like that. It's just kind of education about when you should apply your fertilizer, what's the most efficient way of doing things, storing things so that they're not wasted at harvest. And I think there are a lot of things that we can do before we start to go on the kind of population control level. But I mean, the yeah. The population, the growth of the population is plateauing to a certain extent. It's still going to be very big, but I think, you know, there are ways that.
that we can achieve the increases that we need to, but it really needs to happen in a coordinated way if it's going to be enough. And this brings us back to Alicia and, and your area of expertise, because antibiotics increased life expectancy by 25 years over the last 100 years of their use, which in itself causes problems, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess, again, it's a bit controversial to say we shouldn't have them at all. Um, I mean, I'm always of the opinion of, obviously, with things like antibiotic resistance, you can get an infection at any age. So, you know, obviously you want antibiotics if a child gets really ill. Or um, So I don't think um, we should be saying, you know, let's not use antibiotics. Yeah. Um, I think with antibiotic resistance, um, <coughs> a lot of the problems is there kind of needs to be that political drive as well, because... Um, Obviously, um, there is some element of personal choice, not using them if you don't need them. Um, but you also really need to improve things like diagnostics. So at the moment, if you get an infection, you might be given a broad spectrum antibiotic, which you might not necessarily need, because you need a few days to actually work out what's infecting you. Um, so if we could have more rapid diagnostics, that could mm -hmm. kind of improve those, those kind of problems. Um, so I think it is quite complex, but I think obviously resistance is going to increase and we need to be able to deal with that. Yes. Um, as like the, I'm listening to you, you guys speak and um, populations are growing, uh, people are moving into the cities, uh, we're getting more and more resistant, uh, so, so there's a resistance building to uh, antibiotics. It sounds like it might be a little bit more like cities might become this potential hotbed for disease. <laughs> um, that's just kind of my head. Is like, is that is that something that's a consideration? Is that um, part of you know the field of study that you're in? Is that something not to worry about? And I should just pa pass the mic over or something. Um, again, I hope this isn't too controversial, but I think um, things like vaccination are really important. Um, obviously, there's kind of been that's sort of been slightly decreasing recently because people, I guess, don't trust the science, but vaccination has eradicated and eliminated some really bad diseases. So things like that are really good for um, public health at the moment. Um, and obviously with um, superbugs and things, um, I, mean, I don't think it's a problem at the moment, having cities as a hotbed. Um, but I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Well... I guess diseases like tuberculosis spread more in highly populated areas than they do in sparsely populated areas. Um, but since you're never going to stop people living in close proximity to each other, I think it's something you just have to deal with. But vaccination is key to eradicating disease. Antibiotics will never eradicate disease. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, wait for the mic. What are some of the main areas of research for discovering new um, antibiotics? At the moment, I've heard that you know you can find them in the natural world in certain plants and bacteria. So yeah, I was just interested in what are some of the biggest areas of research at the moment. Yeah, so you're right. Um, so a lot of antibiotics are actually produced by nature, which I think is really cool. So, um, for example, the bacteria that I work on, Streptomyces, they produce around 50 to 70 percent of all antibiotics we actually use. So. Um, in my lab and Matt's lab as well, we're interested in obviously trying to find out what else these bacteria can produce. Because um, in recent years, there's been a huge increase in genome sequencing. So we can actually look in the genomes of these bacteria and basically try and find biosynthetic genes which might produce new compounds. Um, so we've kind of shone a light on this whole um, amazing like expanse of genomic information that could um, um, lead us to finding new antibiotics. Um, another thing is also kind of searching for new types of bacteria that might produce, again, novel antibiotics. Um, and also looking in different kind of environments, different ecological niches. Um, so something Matt's lab works on is um, the really cool system where um, there are some leafcutter ants which have this bacteria on their surface which produce antibiotics to protect them. So um, looking in all kinds of parts of nature, I think, is a really exciting area of research and something that we're definitely working on. I mean, in terms of antibiotics, I think we can be really optimistic because there are, we know there are hundreds of thousands of molecules out there waiting to be discovered. Uh, the downside is it takes 25, 30 years to get them through clinical trials. So there's going to be a lag where the current generation of antibiotics don't work 
before we get the next generation of antibiotics. And we are really reaching the stage now, I think, where uh, there are multi-drug resistant bacteria that can kill us that we don't have antibiotics to treat. Which is quite scary. Yeah. Um, this is not really to do with antibiotic resistance, but um, I don't know your opinion on XR, but you know how 80% of all emissions, CO2 emissions come from like 20 companies or something ridiculous like that. What do you think that we can do to change these companies because it's all good us cutting down on meat and dairy and sharing our cars but if we don't pressure these companies to change that won't make a lot of difference so what do you think we can do and do you think xr are doing the right thing or just what is your opinion surrounding that laurie i think this one for you um well i think you hit the nail on the head really when you said how do we pressure these companies to change? Um, and that's exactly what we have to do, I think, is to pressure these companies to change. Um, I think I've got a, a slightly interesting observation about this. Um, so, you know, there's this, this notion that um, what can we as individuals do when there are so many big, like, organisations who have carbon footprints which are so much infinitely higher than our own as individuals? So, like are we just a drop in the ocean when it comes to trying to reduce our own emissions? But then if you think everything that we do as consumers comes from somewhere as well, and so as consumers ourselves, we have enormous power. So the choices that we make can also have an impact higher up. Um, and all these big companies and organizations are producing products and services, which we then have a choice if we want to support or not. Um, and so I think sometimes it's it's easy to kind of lose that perspective um, and just to feel a little bit hopeless. But you know, you've got you've got power as well in the choices that you make. So we should force them to change, not governments. Um, I mean, if we can do like a double-headed threat, then that would be perfect. <laughs> but I don't think that we should just sit back and like pass it off onto government or legislation to fix it. I I do think that. The public voice has great power as well. Yeah. Um, when you're saying about like kind of eradicating as many car users as you can, mm. do you think in terms of like certain companies that um, promote and manufacture cars that they should that there should be like alternative options available because it's all well to say, like, oh, we, we can pressure these companies to stop producing so many cars, but, like, all of those workers are then going to need other places. Do you think it's about, like, a large systematic change to, like, replace and have new options rather than just, like, getting rid of things? Yes. That's a really good question because that is pretty much the only industry we have left, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that is a really good question. Um, so I think... Rather than just saying we should not have cars, we need to change the way in which we use cars. And so instead of individuals owning a car, we can still have access to cars. But um, like I mentioned, there was that study which said for every one shared car, you can eradicate 20 like individual cars. Um, and so in London now, um, BMW and Daimler have joined up and have launched a free-floating car system, car share system. And so there are now, I think it's like about 20,000 BMW and Daimler branded cars, which you can sign up. Um, I think you pay on a subscription basis, but then you can also pay as and when you use them. Um, and I think this is a way in which businesses are responding to people's changing demands as well. Um, you know, also I think millennials are, are wanting things on a kind of a subscription package rather than owning something. So if you think about how popular Netflix is now compared to 20 or 15 or 10 years ago when you would go and you would buy a video or buy a DVD and own it in your library. So it's that kind of shift in mentality, like we can still have something and have access to it, but we don't have to own it. And I do think that big car companies are responding to that as well. Yeah, it's a good point. My children don't even know what a video is, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> it's completely beyond them or a CD. Mm. Uh, anyone else got any questions? No? 
Uh, okay. A lot of drugs that are used um, for humans can be used for animals, but they're not licensed for animals. Um, when we're talking about antibiotics, is there a restriction in the variety of antibiotics that can be used for animals? Um, I'm thinking of our own pets as well, but um, is this um, a problem? Yeah, so actually one of the EU uh, legislations was to do with making sure we're not using antibiotics that are critical for humans in animals. Um, so that is something that um, I think people are trying to reduce. Um, obviously, kind of unlicensed antibiotics probably is still a problem because um, a lot of the times antibiotics will be kind of part of a particular class of drugs. So if you kind of evolve resistance to one of those um, candidates of one class, then you're probably resistant to everything in that class. So, um, yeah, obviously overuse is still a problem. That was your question? Yes. Okay. okay. <coughs> uh, what is the solution to the oil industry in terms of its continual destruction of the environment and what would be the impacts of that? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> How do you make the oil industry change? Um, I don't really know what to say to that, to be honest. That is a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the public perception towards oil, the oil industry is changing. Um, I think especially in response to like the the recent disasters that have happened, so like the Deepwater Horizon disaster and then the um so the Shell um oil spill. Um I don't really know. I mean maybe I'm just gonna say oil's gonna run out, so something's gonna change at some point anyway. Um yeah. in a hundred years. Two hundred years. Uh <laughs> I mean they're responsible for plastic pollution as well, presumably. We can pin that on them as well, yeah. can't we? Yeah, we can, Plastic's yeah. Made from crude oil. Put all these problems on the oil on yeah. the oil industry. Yeah, absolutely. Governments don't really want to introduce legislation like that. No, but how do you, how do you implement those things like the world infrastructure? Yeah, I think it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. The governments don't care, I think, about most of these problems. Yeah. Unless there's enough pressure. The only way to change governments is to press for the population to pressure them, right? Like the climate change process. I mean, it's remarkable, really. Politicians are... Uh, uh, constantly having a go at uh, Greta and, and the climate change process because they're scared of it, I think. So maybe that pressure, popular, you know, people do have a lot of power. I think it's linked to technology as well. Technology, if it's successful, uh, it's an investment. So when you get a massive investment in all the technology that can all be put in play for all, then it's good for something in China. So maybe mm -hmm. technology because of science yeah I think you're right I mean I'm a scientist so I'm biased but I think pretty much all of our problems are going to be solved by technology uh, and changes in technology rather than changes in public behavior to be yeah, honest thanks <laughs> <laughs> maybe not all of our problems yeah. there's a part to play for both but if we don't change the technologies we're in big trouble right yeah Yeah. And do, without wanting to get into politics too much, but do governments care? Because they're not government for very long. So they're not really thinking about 50 years ahead, are they? Yeah. Yeah, they don't care what happens in 50 years, do they? Yeah. Anyone else got any thoughts? I think there also has to be a perceived benefit. So it's very difficult to make people change until they can really see how it's impacting on their lives, whether that's us as individuals or 
politicians. So like like you say, if they're not caring about what's happening 50 years ahead, they're not going to change anything. But if it's going to impact them now and they mm -hmm. can see it happening, then and there's I a think huge, that's when people start to change. There's a huge rise in veganism right, and vegetarianism, mm. don't you think? Which, which I think is really interesting. It's suddenly become, uh, maybe just with the younger generations, yeah. I mean, my children are vegetarian, so we're all vegetarian in my house. But, but my kids don't ever ask to eat meat. They kind of embrace that. Yeah, which I think is, well, it's a big cultural change, right? Because yeah. I mean, there when was I was a, a kid, you couldn't find vegetarian food in yeah. a restaurant, whereas now it's pretty common. Yeah, and I mean that is clearly a massive response to from like the industry to seeing what people want and then shifting to the things that are available. Mm. I mean, that's still a personal choice, but. Yeah, like you say, these th things can shift. It takes time, and sometimes things really gain traction. Um, yeah. Mm. Would you rather be vegan or eat insects? I think that's an interesting question. Because everybody says, you know, if we're insect protein, that would solve a lot of our problems. Yeah, that's true. And I think it's kind of, yeah, it's very easy to feel removed from all these things, but then when actually they start appearing in your daily life, then I think that's when people start to make changes. Mm. Anyone got any thoughts on that? Sorry, can you wait, wait for the mic? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how many people have actually made some changes to their diet that they've either cut down on meat and dairy or they've become um, vegetarian, vegan. Um, have to have perhaps a show of hands? Yeah. So who's cut down their meat intake or, or stopped eating meat? <laughs> A lot of people. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Dairy. Meat. Yes. Who's cut down on dairy? <laughs> <laughs> so is that? I mean, do you do you think that reducing meat is as important as reducing use of cars and aeroplanes? Do you think it can make as big a difference, or is it? Because some people say actually it's a bit of a red herring, really, and the meat industry is not responsible for climate change. I think it's a lot of things together. I think it's not the sole thing. I think as with all of these big issues, it's a combination of factors. Um, I mean, reducing meat has benefits in terms of the planet's health, in terms of individual health, but it's not the only solution. And I'm not like saying you should definitely go meat free, like that is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, I think all of these things have to happen together. It's like what you were saying, right? Like on an individual level, it's the cause that are the issue. When you scale it up, it might not be, but it will make a difference so i'm still interested in that the kind of i mean our car is the biggest problem Could I because yeah um yeah sorry <laughs> so there was a paper that came out um at the end of 2017 and it got quite a lot of media attention and it suggested four widely applicable high impact ways that individuals can make a significant dent in their carbon footprint um one of them was to uh, live car free. Another one was to avoid flying. Thirdly, was to eat a plant based diet. And fourthly, which personally I find s slightly more controversial than the others, is to have one fewer child. Um, but the combination of these four factors will make. That's impossible to change once you've had your children, <laughs> though, right? <laughs> that is true. But also, it, um, well. it quantified these emissions each year. So if you just have one fewer child each year, then I think, <laughs> I think it's. <laughs> How many children are people having each year? <laughs> yeah. but, um, so together, those are the four actions that are recommended okay. that when taken together will have a sizable uh, reduction in your, in your um, personal footprint. What's the optimal number of children to have then? Two? I guess zero, Two really, yeah. so no. in terms of, in terms of the planet. Any, then we wouldn't have a global <laughs> population, would we? Yeah. If everybody stopped having children. Yeah. Surely if you replace yourselves, the population stays the same. I guess, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I've got you. I think actually, if I could go back, I probably would choose a dog because <laughs> yeah. it's too late now. I'm quite fond of them now. Yeah. Um, actually, it's interesting. To, I know we're joking about having a dog, but also not having a pet was lit further down in this list. Um, like really? the That's so bad as well. So apparently, the carbon footprint of having a dog is the same as a round trip transatlantic flight per year. Um, I don't know about guinea pigs. <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. Any, yes? Um, this is more of a statement than like a question, but I think that 
even though everybody is really annoyed at politicians, that they don't listen to us. Personally, I think it's still really important to vote because there are people who will always vote if they are getting money funded by the government, which a lot of companies that are doing the damage are, they will always vote. Mm. And there are some people who are worse than others in government. So I think that even if you're really apathetic about what is going on and that you think that government should do more, there are political parties that like care and mm. it's still really important to vote because there will always be people higher up who do vote. And yep. then those parties will get in. I and completely agree. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any more questions for the panel? Yes, yeah, at the back there. Yeah. Uh, things like medical advice, what foods are good and things like that, in the past, not, not, perhaps not so much now, I find, a lot of people find them confusing unless they're experts. Uh, for instance, I've, I've been asked whether I would like the flu jab. Some people have said it's a good idea. Some people say it isn't. I, I just don't know, you know. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good point, yeah. What did yeah. You, I mean, how, how are people supposed to know who to trust <laughs> when they're getting conflicting advice? Should you trust the government? Um, I think that is a very big question in terms of how, like, how do you know what information is reliable and what isn't? And I guess that's a very big thing in like the era of fake news and all of the stuff that goes around on social media. And I think it's really it's a difficult one to say because a lot of these things like advice are based on the trust that you have um, in people. And I think the one thing that for me is personally very scary is the fact that we're getting into this era where people are saying we shouldn't trust the experts mm. and I think that's a really scary place to be in whereas there is this distrust between you know people who are ex have expertise in certain areas mm. and then being say say for example some people who will then for their own advantage say no this isn't true or this is mm. this other thing I think it's really important to be critical of the information that you see around online and things like that and I don't know I think it's on us as individuals mm. to be aware that there will be misinformation out there yes. and to really critically evaluate the sources um, that you're getting and I think that like for medical advice and things like doctors I think know what they're talking about yeah, yeah I always um, tend to trust experts yeah well. exactly and <laughs> No, it's just being able to, I don't but, know. But this is part of the reason that as scientists we have a responsibility to go out there and talk to people about science because the better yeah. informed people are about all of these things, I think the more confident they feel. Yeah, in, and in I, think making it, yeah. Choices I think it's really difficult hope. because these kind of things are very emotive issues because they affect people on a very personal level. Um, so I think it's really important, yeah, like the reliance is on us and on everybody to just try and make sure that, you know, the truth is kind of out there and it's communicated and I think that's a really important thing with science is that it can't happen removed from society like I think there's a really like obviously science has a really important role to play but it's kind of meaningless if it's done behind closed doors and then isn't communicated out mm. and so I think there's a lot that can be said for dialogue between kind of scientific research and all that and the public and also it's important for us as scientists to like keep check that the research we're doing is relevant to society as well mm -hmm. yeah thank you uh, yeah. uh, is there any scientific data on chemicals that are produced from all the millions of tonnes of bombs that have been dropped on the earth and which subsequently go into the environment and the atmosphere? It's <laughs> <laughs> an interesting question. I don't know. I literally don't know the answer. Yeah, I have. Um, or even I've if anybody cares enough. You know, if governments care enough to investigate things like that. It'd be interesting to even know how many unexploded bombs there are in the world, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only, the only thing we know for certain is that we have polluted this planet pretty badly over the last, well, since the Industrial Revolution, right? Well, that's from our Nagasaki events back all right, though. <laughs> I guess it took a while, but, yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, person at the back first. Okay. 
not a question, but I would just like to comment on a sentiment that was expressed earlier that technology will solve all our problems. I, I think this is a quite dangerous way of thinking because actually the combination of climate models and combining models of different socioeconomic paths that the world might take, um, these modeling effor efforts show that um, when, when we compare a world that is cooperating internationally and thinking more sustainably to a world that purely re relies on technology and also strongly relies on um, net negative emission technologies, which are not proven at on scale at all, then it shows that um, yeah, it's more likely to hit our 1.5 degree uh, targets if in this world, which um, yeah is more about thinking sustainably and also changing behaviors instead of purely relying on technology. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're right, I was being deliberately controversial, but, uh, but I do have faith in science and technology to change things for the better and not always, you know, for the worse. Did you have a question? Cheers. Um, going back to the wheat farming research that you do, what are some of the main arguments that you hear against um, doing that kind of genetic coding and changing the you know, the genetic sequencing and genomes of these wheat crops, what are some of the main ethical arguments and other arguments against doing that work? And then combat that if you please. <laughs> yeah, so that's, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think that one thing that is important to say is like the really aggressive anti-GM uh, opinion that exists, um, I think it, it was kind of born out a lot, a lot of, Firstly, bad science and bad communication of science. And I think that the media also has a really big part to play in that and making GMOs these really big scary things, which was not really based on much scientific basis. And then that got to the big scary argument. So actually, the, on the biggest level, the arguments that I have heard against GMOs are GMOs are bad and I hate them. And then that's it. But there are, there are some valid concerns. Um, so one of the things is that as a technology, the reason that we have legislation against it is because it hasn't been proven to be safe. But the reason it hasn't been proven to be safe is because it hasn't been given a chance to be tested. So that is kind of a bit of a circular argument. I think that some of the things um, that people uh, seem to be concerned about or are concerned about is uh, whether, say, you create a crop that is resistant to a pest or a disease, can that then generate super weeds, for example? Could that gene then go out into the other plants um, and then propagate as like super weeds like that are completely resistant to all kinds of pesticides? Um, the thing is that resistance genes exist out there already in nature. Um, and it's kind of, there's no reason that a gene that was introduced by GM is any more likely to be transferred to natural populations than a gene that was bred in because a particular variety of wheat, for example, was already resistant to a pest. Um, so that's one of those things. And then also something that you can do to combat these things if people are concerned about kind of pollen transfer from genetically modified organisms to the wider ecosystem is to have uh, these kind of pollen barriers where you have non-GM wheat surrounding these things so that then the pollen can't really get past that barrier. So that's one of the um, concerns. And then, so I think, I think really the concerns are what the effects of the GM would be and you won't know that until you've tested it. And I think really the, really the thing for me is to not legislate or criticize the technology itself, but to like assess what's being made with it. So I think, yeah, if you're introducing things that make poisonous wheat, then that's obviously like a bad thing. Um, so one question that was yeah. submitted in advance is why can't we just use more fertilizer and pesticide to grow more food? Yeah, so... Do you, do you get that one a lot? <laughs> yeah, well, it's an interesting one because some people will say, why can't we use more? And other people say we use too, far too much already. Because fertilizer is not... Well, I guess most people would say that fertilizer... We've always used fertilizer. Why mm. is it harmful? So I think one of the things that... One of the things that's really harmful about fertilizer is overuse and misuse of fertilizer. Uh, so 
One of the issues that can come about if you use too much fertilizer is that you, the plant, the crops that it's being used for um, are not able to take it all up. And so the excess then runs off into uh, the water systems and then this can cause really bad problems like algal blooms and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so one of the things is that um, actually just adapting how you use the fertilizer can be really efficient. So applying it when the crop is most likely to be able to use it. Um, and there are interesting studies where show, that show where there is a really kind of optimal use of fertilizers. So beyond a certain point, if you add more, the plant isn't able to use it, so it doesn't help. So we can use fertilizers as much as we want, but if we can't breed crops that are able to use that increased fertilizer, then it's not gonna help. And also kind of, uh, we really need to limit the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that we use because it's very like phosphorus is mined and we've only got like 100 two years 200 years left of it before we start running out so it's not an infinite store um, and then with pesticides again pesticides can be very effective if they're used appropriately but pests build up resistance to pesticides as well so if you overuse a pesticide then you really really increase the pressure on that pest to evolve a way to be resistant to it. So it's similar to antibiotics in a way that you have to be really careful with how you use these things. Um, and then also there is energy that goes into producing the fertilizers and the pesticides. So if you can breed crops that are able to um, themselves defend to a certain level against pests, then that's gotta be a good thing because you're reducing your inputs into the system, which is also re reducing the energy costs as well. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, gentleman at the back first. Um, what, what are the alternatives to antibiotics? Because they're not the only option for treatment, are they? I rem vaguely remember an, a documentary from Russia or the Ukraine about something called phages, maybe. Um, so are there other alternatives? Yeah, so um, bacteriophages is one example. Um, so that's basically a virus which specifically um, attacks a bacterium. So um, I believe it's still sort of in a process where it's not widely used. Um, in some countries, they do use phage therapy, but I think um, obviously with any kind of medicines, there's a very kind of long process of testing safety and efficacy. So I guess that's still kind of in early mm -hmm. stages of being developed. I mean, um, you're right. It, yeah, sorry. But, uh, in Georgia and Russia, they've been using it for about 100 years, but in the UK, it's never really been popular. A cooperation with those countries to develop that approach. There's a lot of companies. There's a lot of biotech companies in the UK now developing phage as antibiotics. I mean, part of the problem is public perception because you have to take a virus to kill a bacteria, mm -hmm. and a lot of people, you know, unless you really, again, if you have a life-threatening infection, I suppose you would take anything. But uh, there is a marketing issue, I think. I've got a s totally separate question. If if we complete all the actions that you've talked about tonight, um, w will it be enough? Because uh, I know a number of scientists have tried to calculate if we take uh, all reasonable steps to combat global warming now, it's it's getting rather late. So, and uh, how is the kind of action plan ever going to be developed so that we can combat global warming? That's a big question. Yeah. I'm looking at you, Laurie, for that one. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of pathways which have been developed um, which try and model how emissions are going to go between now and 2050, which is when the Paris Agreement target is. Um, but there's also so many unknowns in that. So we don't know what's going to happen to the, the global population. We don't know what's going to happen to the urban population. Um, you know, economic growth, is that going to continue? Is that not going to continue? Like, our, our land use change, how is that going to affect all of this? Um, and so with all these kind of projections, there's so much variability in that as well. And it's partly due to the amount of unknowns that we have. Um, I think regardless of that, it's still important to kind of take ownership for what we can and do what we can and just hope that it all is going to piece in nicely together <laughs> and result in, um, result in a nice uh, decline in emissions. Um, I read a, a really nice paper um, recently which suggested that if everyone halves their emissions every decade, it should be okay. But it works at every level. So as an individual, if I aim to half my emissions 
um, in 10 years based on today's level. But then, you know, within my family as well, if my family do that, and then the organization I work for, and then as a city that I live in, and then as a country, and if everyone follows this, they call it the rule of 10, so halving every 10 years. Um, I mean, the paper that suggested this action um, did suggest that it, it would keep us below two degrees, which is the ultimate aim of the Paris Agreement um, by 2050. But I, I also like that because it combines what you can do as an individual with what's happening at the highest level too. Um, and so it was a suggestion that can be applied at any, um, at any level. Um, well, I mean, I guess everyone would be accountable at their own level then. So if you follow this, well, this rule. I think the message is... They are, but we consume their products. We consume yeah. their products. Yeah. So we have to change them. Yeah, yeah, but they're accountable to us, so we can change how they behave. On a collective level. Yeah, yeah. If you can get enough people on board, we can change the way the world is. Did you have a question? We're going to have to wrap this up soon, so maybe this will be the last question. And then oh, no, that's pressurising. Make it a good one. Um, obviously, we, like, in the Western world, had um, our industrial revolution, but there's a lot of countries that are kind of still behind on that. And do you think that... It's important to take action to like prevent um, like it kind of all happening again. Or do you think it's kind of unfair to deny other like countries like the things that we've already like messed up? If you know what I mean. It's a good question because China are having an industrial revolution now. Yeah. Do you think it's then people. fair to say no? Like this has gone wrong for us, even though it's us who's actually well the Western world that's actually like made those mistakes. I don't think we could stop them if we wanted to. Yeah. But yeah, what's I mean, happen? That is a really good question, and there's a whole field of research into environmental justice as well. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to say. I mean, again, the optimist within me is hoping that maybe we can just, you know, share the knowledge that we have of renewable energies now and kind of like fast track in a way, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna have to uh, close it now because we have to be out of this room by eight. Um, so it says on my schedule that the panel members like, might like to give a closing statement. Is there something you would, you don't have to, but is there something <laughs> you would like to say to people before? Um, I'm just gonna repeat the four actions, the four high impact actions. Um, which are, yeah, live car free, avoid flying, plant based diet, and have one fewer child. Um, <laughs> it's my closing statement. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that <laughs> sums it up <laughs> pretty well. Um, I think a lot of it, a lot of things come down to awareness and keeping, like, being engaged with the things that are happening around us. and trying to understand what the problems that we face in society, if we can play an individual role. Um, and then if we can't make an impact in like our individual lives, seeing where it is and where the changes need to be made. And even though our individual contributions may seem small, somebody has to do something. So I think <laughs> continuing the dialogue between all different parts of society is really crucial to moving forward. Yep, so obviously I agree there are different kind of personal choices we can make and also I think critically making informed choices, so kind of being aware of the science and being aware of what you can do to even making small changes. I think obviously collectively we can make a difference. Um, I think also just on a topic of kind of politics as well, um, even though you might feel like governments aren't really listening, you can always kind of lobby your MPs to kind of get involved with things or take action or attend certain meetings in Parliament. So. I mean, maybe some might listen more than others, but I think it's always worth trying and feeling like you can do something to kind of make an impact in that way as well. It's really important. Great, thank you. So thank you all for coming, making it a really interesting debate. And thank you to our panelists. <laughs>